Hello, it's Claire here. Just quickly before we start the show, I wanted to mention that I'm looking to connect with CIOs who are planning to hire information security leaders in 2020. If you're a chief information officer or a head of technology who has information security in your remit, and you might have a tactical technical team, but you need a strategic leader, please reach out to me at www.thesecurecio.com forward slash 2020. And I look forward to hearing from you. But now let's go to the show. Welcome to The Secure CIO, the podcast for technology executives who are tasked with hiring and retaining great cybersecurity leaders. Join best-selling author Claire Pales together with industry thought leaders as they answer your questions about sourcing the right leaders, building cybersecurity teams, candidate selection, salaries, skills, and more. Hello, I'm Claire Pales and welcome to The Secure CIO podcast. Today's guest is Fred Thiel. Fred discovered the field of cybersecurity in 1998 while repairing wires terminals and maintaining Linux servers at his university library. Since then, Fred has dedicated himself to a pragmatic approach to cyber, leading teams in large enterprises, mid-sized consulting businesses, and eventually his own consulting firm. Fred is currently the Group CISO at Transport for New South Wales, an avid sailor and lifelong learner. Fred, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks, Claire. It's great to be here. So tell me a little bit about how you got to this point in your career as a leader and also how you've climbed the ranks to being a CISO. Well, it was, um, I guess it's a bit of a story, but here we go. So I was actually on track out of high school to, uh, to be an auto mechanic, so completely not cybersecurity related at all and not even in the computer field. And for whatever reason, at the last minute, it was a decision to attend university. So I'd always been involved in computers and sort of as a side hobby kind of thing, but always interested in sort of the mechanical side as well. In university, studied studied uh, computer science, and it happened to be that the university I went to in uh, in Colorado, it was a big recruiting agency or a big recruiting university for uh, for IBM. So landed a job at IBM, and like anybody who's gone through the um, technical ranks in school, knows that when you get out with a computer science degree, you, you're you bombarded with jobs about being a database administrator or being a Java developer or those kind of things. And I had all those opportunities at IBM, but they were building up a, a cybersecurity team. So it ended up, I got an interview with the cybersecurity team at the, at the very end of the day. Yeah, they were building up their managed security services business. So that was late 90s, early 2000s. So to some extent, you know, the entry into this field was, I just got lucky. I never had a, a dream of being a cybersecurity expert or anything like that. It just, just happened to be all the planets aligned. And through that, I think, took sort of a standard approach that a lot of CISOs do and a lot of uh, cybersecurity people do, right? They grow up through the ranks. You start as a very technical person and you do a lot of pen testing and application development and that kind of thing. Eventually, landed a few jobs within IBM that got to be a team leader. So leading a team of penetration testers and application assessment type of people, all within the managed security services business. So I think it's really important to have sort of that grounding and that foundation in, in technology, but then also have that um, people leadership skill or, uh, as, you, as you're growing up through the ranks. One of the things that I, that I found to be invaluable after IBM sort of got sick of working in, in the corporate land and, and looked around and decided, like a lot of people, that you might be able to go out and do this on your own. So went out and was a consultant for a while. And I think being a consultant, you get that, that expertise of being in front of people, of pitching who you are and what you do and customer facing. Having that consulting background, I think, adds a lot to the technology piece. So if you if you start off with the with the technology bit and sort of move on to uh, to being a consultant at some point, I think you you start to really well round yourself out. And then at at one point, you know, got involved with a lot of the vendor side of the uh, vendor side of the house. So after being a client at IBM, went over to the vendor side and uh, worked with HP a bit. Started using a lot of the products at HP was selling it and eventually started selling a lot of those products, doing things like building out security operation centers and things like that. Eventually started our own business. Again, like a lot of people, you you sort of, you get around the traps a little bit and then you decide, hey, we can do this. We can go and bill ourselves out at an exorbitant rate and become consultants and do this ourselves. 
So paired up with some people that I had worked with back in the IBM days, and we started a, a company that, um, that built security operation centers. So again, sort of in the 2005, 2007, 2008, started doing a lot of security operation center build outs. And this was at a time where it was really important for internal businesses to build out their own internal capabilities. So got a lot of experience around the, the operational side of the house in security, which really brings about, you know, the whole people process and technology together. There's nothing like an operations team to really understand how incident response works, what to do when incidents happen, gives you a little bit of that pressured environment. Plus it lets you kind of test the abilities of the teams to respond in, in high pressure environments. And on top of that, got the, the crash course, the MBA crash course in, in owning your own business. And then went back to um, the client side of the house, worked for, for the Commonwealth Bank for a bit, moved out to Australia and eventually made my way here to, uh, to transport for New South Wales. And so you mentioned that you never really aspired to go into cyber, but once you were in it, do you think that being a CISO was something that you saw in your future? It was always far off. It was always one of those things that's kind of like being a parent. You always see yourself maybe as being a parent, but not tomorrow and not in a week's time and not in a month's time. It just, over time, it sort of, it sort of just happens. And I think... You know, I was always always on the lookout, as many people are, for what's next in the career and what's the next logical step. And at some point, you have a, enough different jobs within the technology arena and within the cybersecurity space. Eventually, you have that sort of breadth to be able to to put it all together and and lead a team of people that can that can deliver a cybersecurity program. And that's you know, I've been privileged and lucky enough to to find myself in a position now where I've done that for for Velocity Frequent Flyer, part of Virgin Australia, and as well as um, you know, moving into to transport larger organization. And speaking of velocity, so when you worked there, you were reporting directly to the CEO. I'm interested in your opinion on reporting lines for a CISO or a head of security. And, and do you think it matters given that, you know, we've talked on the podcast with other guests about most reporting lines going into the CIO. Uh, what are your thoughts about where this role should sit? One, I think, lesson that I learned, I think, in Velocity is just because you report to the CEO doesn't necessarily mean you have a seat at the table. And what I mean by that is is you might have the CEO's ear, you have one-on-ones with the CEO, and you can sort of talk to them about what the current events are happening in, uh, in cyberland and sort of what the board needs to pay attention to. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're part of the inner circle that you're sitting at the table and making strategic business decisions about where the company's going. And I, and I kind of found myself in that position at Velocity where, sure, I reported to the CEO. Sure, I could, I could have that say when I needed it or when there was a big incident or, or something that the CEO needed to be aware of. But I didn't find myself with a seat at the table. It was a difficult position to be in. So a lot of my time at Velocity was, was more of an advisory role. And um, ended up doing more actually digital transformation kind of work at mm-hmm. Velocity and moving them into from from a um, sort of on-prem environment into a cloud environment with new websites and APIs, but thinking about how to move data in a more secure way to the cloud. So the audience of the podcast can clearly hear that you're not from around here. How have you found building teams and hiring cybersecurity professionals? across maybe Australia or compared to the US? And, and why do you think there's been a difference for you if, if there has been? I don't think it's that much different than it is uh, here than it is in the US. Um, somebody once told me, said, um, you know, when you find the good people, you've got to hang on to them and don't let go. And, and I find that no matter where you are, you, that, that sort of golden rule always applies. When you find the, the right people or the good people, hang on to them because, you know, you're sort of always dealing with the, the 80 20 kind of thing but um yeah find the good people don't let them go i think the biggest difference in australia is just just sheer numbers the population is smaller and therefore you have smaller uh smaller population of people that are cyber or even technology experts you talk about the skills shortage and everybody's talking about skill shortage i think i don't really buy into that whole thing i think that there's ways around skill shortage and i think a lot of times Skill shortage is used by by people who have a, a vested interest in having there be a skill shortage, right? So you talk about vendors or, or or consultants; they're the people that are really sort of pitching this whole skill shortage thing. I mean, I've had great experience, and maybe it's just a a, a function of 
having a good recruiting within the firms I've been lucky to be a part of. But, you know, when you have a graduate program and you have, uh, when you're bringing good talent through and new talent through, there's an immense amount of opportunity there. Just because there aren't as many, you know, highly skilled people or people that have 20 years of experience in the, uh, in the business doesn't mean that there's not people with aptitude and attitude and ability to, to do cybersecurity things or technology things. So I find that a lot of times instead of talking about skill shortage or talking about a lack of people, there's opportunity to, to, to grow those people, right? To bring in those people that either have a small technology background or, or minimal technology background. Uh, graduates who have the aptitude and attitude and willingness to, to get out there and learn new things. One thing I mentioned at the beginning was I, I, I really was going to be an auto mechanic coming out of high school. And, and interestingly enough, some of the best people I've worked with in cyber have been former plumbers and electricians. They just have this, <laughs> this ability to take into account large complex systems and troubleshoot and boil it out to its essence. So, you know, one of the best guys I, I've ever worked with was a, was a plumber, and he could troubleshoot absolutely anything. And I think it's because you understand the system as opposed to memorizing the system. So you sort of know from A to B to C mm -hmm. what happens. And if you have that concept in your head, I think there's no such thing as really a skill shortage. It's just a matter of training the people up with the right aptitude. We're certainly talking on the podcast um, this season and, and across the seasons to people who are trying to similar to you, talk about ways of training people who might have some of the skills needed but just need that cybersecurity side of things um, or they just need some additional training or, or on-the-job experience. And I think there there is a lot of people nodding in violent agreement with what you said that, you know, you've just got to look in the right places and, and look at people who have problem-solving skills and who are inquisitive and keen to uh, laterally move into, you know, out of plumbing, as you say, and into a role where they can continue to solve problems but just of a, of a slightly different nature. And I liked what you said about grads as well because there are plenty out there coming out of unis. And I, what I've heard from a lot of people is that they're really struggling to get jobs. And that surprises me because they are lower down in the salary chain but they've got a lot to offer and they're hungry to learn. And I'm interested in what you have had in terms of experience around grad programs and, and choosing grads, you know, if you talk about choosing a plumber and, and the skills that they've got, how do you choose graduates? Because most of them have very, very little experience. So I was lucky enough to, um, to work at the Commonwealth Bank for a while. And one of the things that they do is they've got a fantastic grad program. So you might have a cohort come through of 4,000 graduates and only about 120 of them end up making the cut into the final funnel competing for maybe 20 or 30 jobs within the bank. So you end up getting, that's an extreme example, but you end up getting some of the key people that are coming out of university. And it was interesting the way that they used to run that was, you know, you, you'd come in and obviously it's like a, a, a giant funnel. So you go through all of these different stages and a lot of the stages are really based around practical exercises. So you'd develop a scenario and put, a group of people or one or two people in that scenario and sort of see how it is that it, the scenario played out and have them understand what was going on, present like they were presenting to the board and, and really just follow that practical exercise for a few hours. And to me, I think that type of exercise is way more valuable than say a, a whiteboard session about, you know, how much mathematics that you know, or how much, um, different kind of scripting languages or programming languages that you know or how to solve a problem in a particular programming language. It's that real world on your feet, think of how to solve this problem right now because you're in front of the board type of situation that really sort of separates the cream from the crop, I think. Yeah, the real life, real world challenges that, you know, it's not, as you say, how much have you learned out of a textbook, but it's, it's how would you respond to a situation that's brand new to you as well. Yep. Absolutely. And so when you think about grads, they obviously have a particular set of skills, but there are many other staff that you need to put around you. And do you, have you had principles that you've used to make sure that you're knitting together a team that have complementary skills? Or how do, you work, how do you operate when you're putting together maybe a new team or adding to a current team? I think we're all familiar with the, the four stages of team building. Yeah. Forming, storming, norming, and performing. 
And so this whole idea of putting a team together and that team comes together, does a little bit of storming because everybody's learning about how each other work together. You finally sort of get over that stage, if you can get over that stage into a, um, you know, norming into what your roles and responsibilities are. And then ultimately into a real high performance team where everybody understands how everybody works. Everybody knows their complementary skill sets and are happy to perform uh, and work in that environment. And, and I think a lot of times the, the approach that I take, a couple of principles that I always use are always hire uh, people that are smarter than you and surround people that are smarter than you. Sometimes you run into situations where that doesn't happen. And I think leadership and upper management, when that occurs, it it really shows sort of that you're not surrounding yourself with the right people. If you do surround yourself with those smarter, better people, I think, you know, all those complementary skill sets end up coming together, not just from a skills perspective, but if you're hiring people that think exactly like you do, you're going to get sort of a very skewed view of what's going on in the enterprise. If you hire people that have those highly complementary skill sets, right? So somebody who's got a lot of energy and thinks really quickly and does things very quickly, paired up with somebody who's maybe a little bit more methodical, maybe a little bit more strategic thinking, those two people aren't going to get together and get along in the first instance. It's going to take time for them to get along because they need to learn each other's way of uh, way of thinking, way of operating. But if you can get over that and get past the whole storming phase of that team, the benefits are huge, absolutely massive, because then everybody learns how to play off of each other's skill set. Ego goes out the door. Um, so you get this really high-performance team, which is difficult to get to. But if you can get there, I think... It's an amazing thing when you when you can. I think you make an important point about some leaders are looking to build a team of complementary skills around, you know, you're, you've got a leader, you might have an architect, you might have an analyst, you might have a, a security specialist. From that perspective, you're building up t- uh, skills that knit together and are complementary. But as you say, once you overlay the personalities as well, and the way people like to operate, that's a whole kind of other level of complementary, um, the complementary nature and culture of the team, which I guess is a whole, probably a whole other podcast, but it's an approach, I guess, that you have to take to not just thinking about the capabilities you need in the team, but who's going to be delivering them. Absolutely. And I think it's really hard to get there. A lot of teams, I think, end up failing before they get there because getting past some of those stages of forming up a team is it's difficult, it's hard, it's personal. It requires a lot of fortitude to break through. You've worked in lots of different organisations and built teams across your career. Have you found that different types of organisations, so government, banking, um, your own company and consulting and vendors, have you found that you face different hurdles depending on the type of organisation you've worked in? I think there's always different types of specific hurdles depending on where you are. In finance, for instance, a lot of times the culture is go, 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 and it's very, very aggressive, or it can be. Sometimes in government, it looks a little bit more laid back or people get the idea that it's a little bit more, uh, it's slower, it's more bureaucratic, it's more political, that kind of thing. So you have those sort of nuances, I think, depending on what sector that you're in. But at the end of the day, I think people are in it for a couple of things. And one of those things is interesting, meaningful work. You know, a lot of people throw throw a bunch of money at skills and try to steal people away from other organizations by, you know, throwing money at people. And and that's that's fine. You can you can get and build a decent team that way. But if you don't have that interesting, meaningful work, I think you you end up with the same problem that everybody else has, which is how do you retain staff? So if you, if you approach it as, look, we've got a mission at hand, we've got to make security better at this place or whatever the mission might be, if you put that flag in and you say, okay, well, there's some basics, basics we have to get done, but here's some really interesting kind of side projects that we have within each one of the teams that keep life interesting, that sort of think about things in an 18 to 24 to 36 month view. I think that's, that's really where people are are interested in, in, in working for a company. And I find, in particular, this is uh, working at Transport as my first job in government. I find that in government, there's more, I guess, purpose behind the work because in private sector, a lot of times you're driven by 
profit. You're driven by quarterly results. Government doesn't work like that. You, know, you, have a, you have a government that's in, you have a government that's there for a certain amount of time. And depending on the mission of that department and the government, transport, for instance, keep transport up and running, keep it safe, secure, make New South Wales you know, a happy place to, to work, live, and play, that has meaning because it touches a lot of people on a daily basis, right? And it's not profit driven. It might be cost driven. You might need to take cost out every year. That's fine, but it's not. It's not profit driven. So I think that, that there's a little bit of a different, a little bit of a nuance there that makes for some really interesting sort of socioeconomic work or some meaningful work in government departments. You make a very interesting point about retention because we're always putting pressure on candidates to differentiate themselves and have you know something different about their experience or to meet our requirements and on a retention side from the organization you know they also have a responsibility to make the role interesting and to stretch that that leader as well and, and provide them with opportunity to to grow and excel so it's sort of a duty on both sides I think to have roles that are really interesting and you can get your teeth into and using that to attract candidates, but from a candidate perspective, you know, then bringing some interesting skills as well that make those stretch opportunities possible. What do you wish you'd known about building teams when you started as a leader that might have helped you along the way? And I've heard other people on your podcast say it, but the people side of the house is, is hard. And, and you don't realize how hard it is until, until you're in the thick of it. So it's not just that you're being challenged with difficult skills-based work or difficult problems to solve and that kind of thing. When the problems are technology-related or the problems are, are related to your domain, solving those problems, it's, it's fairly straightforward, if you will. But when you start, when you start dealing with the, the people aspects behind building teams, the dynamics of the different types of people that are out there that you didn't know were out there, and how to put those people together in a way that they can operate and function on a daily basis to achieve a common goal, it's, it's very difficult. And it can become very personal, even if, you don't, even if you don't want it to, right? Even if you're trying to separate sort of that personal and that business side of things, a lot of times, you know, we're emotional beings, we're human, we all get, we all get emotional. So that human side of the thing, of the house can be, don't underestimate it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. The other thing I didn't, expect is that you're you'll be under a microscope more than you think you will and that's not just from your upper management and that kind of thing but you know as a leader when you walk around everything that you do people watch right how you dress how you act how you hold yourself people pay attention and and in in a leadership position you're much more influential than you think you are so i guess it's just mm -hmm. a matter of making sure that you realize that you're setting culture by just walking around the office not to not to deter any leaders, future leaders out there away from, from doing it. It's, it's a great thing, but I guess it's just something to be, to be mindful of. There's this thing called the Johari window, which I find is a really interesting tool that you can use to sort of understand a little bit more about yourself. And it's, it's based, it's a quadrant kind of based model, but it's based on, you know, what you know about yourself and don't know about yourself and what other people know about you and don't know about you. So this is the idea that the things that you do know about yourself and that other people know about you, that's sort of the front facing persona. But for instance, the things that you don't know about you, but other people see about you are blind spots. So understanding that and discovering more about those blind spots and how it is that you're perceived it, it helps with self-awareness, but it also helps in, in situations like leadership positions. You can um, you just understand the whole self instead of you know what other people see about you. And there's a, a, a lot more to think about. So we might put a link in the show notes to some information about the Jahari window. I've read about that too, and and it's a very interesting self-awareness exercise to have a read about that stuff. So thank you for raising that. And I, I think from the perspective of the listeners, the people side, as you've said. It, it can't be underestimated. Fred, how can people find out more about you and connect with you? So I'm on LinkedIn. I don't do Facebook. I deleted my Facebook account a while back. And I don't really post on social that often, so I'm not on Twitter. But uh, LinkedIn is probably the best way to find me. I think I've got a couple other photo sites out there, a couple other hobby sites, but um, that's probably the best way to find me. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your wisdom about building teams throughout your career and in your experience. And I really appreciate your time um, to share with the listeners today. My pleasure. Thanks, for, uh, thanks a lot for having me. That's all we have time for today. 
Thanks so much for listening. For more information on all our guests, check out the show notes at thesecurecio.com where you can also find more information on the Secure CIO framework and sign up for my newsletter. If you loved the show, please subscribe to the podcast and feel free to leave me a five-star rating. I'll see you next week. Bye.